Praise the Lord, friends. Shalom. My name is Judah Antoine. Shall we pray as we begin another episode on the Victory Series? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we just want to come into your presence once again. And Father, we ask right now that even as we come before your presence, Father, that your word would go forth like a double-edged sword, will meet and minister to every need, would revive the drooping spirit, Lord God. Come, Lord Jesus, set our hearts on fire with fire of your love right now. Come Holy Spirit and kindle in the hearts of the faithful the fire of your love. Come Holy Spirit, we need you right now. Blessed Mother, we ask for your intercession. Together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord, friends. Shalom. And welcome once again to another episode on the Victory Series. And praise the Lord. This is the final, the last and the final episode in this entire series. We've been considering Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If you've been following all the episodes, this is episode number seven. And if you've been calling, following us in all the episodes, we've been talking about how to go across to the other side of the lake. How God wants to take you to that place of victory in your life. Defeating your personal giants, the power of praise, spiritual authority, the double word of God, the authority of the name of Jesus and how to command in the name of Jesus. And we heard about the weapons of our warfare, about spiritual warfare. And in this 
the final, the seventh and the final episode, we're going to be talking about something that is very, very interesting, but also very, very important. In this final episode, we're going to be talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit and how the anointing breaks every yoke in your life and my life. The power of the Holy Spirit that comes to empower us to break and to destroy every yoke in our life. Taken from Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. On that day, his burden shall be removed from your shoulders. Whatever burden that you're carrying, that burden will be removed from your shoulders. And his yoke shall be destroyed from your neck. Whatever yoke that is on you will be destroyed. His burden will be removed and his yoke shall be destroyed. It's very interesting because it's from this verse. Jesus takes Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all those who are weary and who are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Of course, the yoke of Jesus is easy, but the, bur the yoke of slavery, the yoke of bondage is very heavy. The yoke of bondage and slavery is very heavy. And God wants to break that yoke that is over your life and give you a yoke that is easy and light. And it continues to say that the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The anointing of the Holy Spirit will break that yoke in your life. What exactly is a yoke? A yoke is the, the piece of wood that binds two cows together as they are plowing the field side by side. So, unfortunately, for many of us, we have a yoke over our shoulders, just like these cows have a yoke over their neck. And the yoke is a burden. And Isaiah 10, 27 says, this burden will be removed from your shoulders and this yoke shall be destroyed from your neck, the yoke that is over you, that is pulling you down. What yoke could it be, friends? This yoke that that Isaiah is talking about is the yoke of bondage to sin, is the yoke of addiction to sin, the yoke of maybe depression, the yoke of anxiety, worry, stress. It's a yoke of the problems in your married life, the financial problems that you are undergoing. These all represent the yoke on your neck. And Isaiah says, this yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing that is present in your life. We've been considering the different weapons of the warfare. And yesterday we spoke about the power of the Lordship of Jesus over your life for the light to dispel all darkness. But then you have within you the power of the Holy Spirit. So not just the light of Jesus, but you have the power of the Holy Spirit. And this power of the Holy Spirit has the power to break this yoke over your life. And friend, if you're open for this to happen tonight, as we pray, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come in a new way to touch your life and my life and to break that yoke. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 8 and 9, God says, on that day, I will break the yoke of his neck and I will burst his bonds and strangers shall no more make a servant of him. Strangers shall no more make a slave, a servant of you. Friend, God wants to break that yoke, the yoke of slavery to addiction, the yoke of slavery to bondage out of your, your neck, whatever that is tying you down. He wants to set you free. He wants to burst the bonds, the chains that are holding you so that you will no more be a servant with one purpose. And the purpose is very clear so that they shall serve the Lord, their God, so that they shall serve so that you and I can serve the Lord, our God. He wants to break this yoke. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. Isaiah again says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and release to prisoners. This very scripture, Jesus used himself 
in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, as he began his public ministry, he went to the synagogue, opened the scroll to Isaiah, and quoting from this, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Friend, that same anointing that was on Jesus is also on you and I. By virtue of the sacrament of baptism, you too have been anointed. I have been anointed. By the virtue of the sacrament of baptism, by the sacrament of confirmation, for those priests who are watching, by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders, you have been anointed. The word Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach. Mashiach, meaning the anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one who has been sent to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And how is he able to do it? Because the Spirit of the Lord has anointed him. Acts chapter 1, verse 37 to 38, we read how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and power. And he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Hebrews 1, verse 8 to 9, again speaking about the anointing on Jesus, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever. The righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. For you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond all your companions. Jesus, the Son of God, was anointed with the oil of gladness, with the, with the anointing so that he can continue that ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 20 verse 6, For I know that God would help his anointed. God would answer him from the holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Friend, this was a promise on Jesus. But interestingly, it's also a promise on for each one of us, for you and I, because we too are anointed. For I know that the Lord would help his anointed. The Lord would help you and I, because you and I have been anointed. The Lord will help you and I. He will answer from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Friends, by virtue of the anointing, God wants to give you the victory. Psalm 105 verse 15, God says, Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21 to 22, It is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. How? How has God anointed us? By putting his seal on us and giving us his spirit in our heart as the first installment. God has put his seal in us and given us his spirit through the power of the anointing. This anointing came again upon your life and my life through the sacrament of baptism and confirmation. 1 John chapter 2 verse 20 to 27. You have been anointed by the Holy One. You have been anointed. 27 says, the anointing you have received from Him abides in you. And His anointing teaches you all things. God's anointing dwells in you, friends. The power of the Holy Spirit, the oil of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, abides in you. What is this anointing, friends? This anointing is the very power of God, not just the presence of God, but the strength of God. The oil is often used to symbolize the anointing in the Old Testament, and the oil oftentimes is a reference to strength, to power. And this strength and power dwells inside of you. When did the disciples receive the Holy Spirit, friends? At Pentecost? The answer is no. They did not receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. They received the Holy Spirit in the upper room. In the Gospel of John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23, the Bible says in the first day of the week when the disciples were locked together for fear of the Jews, Jesus walked through the wall, stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them. 
He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Friends, that's when they received the Holy Spirit. The disciples didn't receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. They received the Holy Spirit in Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 23. If that is the case, then what was Pentecost? At Pentecost, they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that transformed their lives. The power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that transformed their lives. When did you and I receive the Holy Spirit? You and I received the Holy Spirit on the day of our baptism. That's the first instance we received the Holy Spirit. And later on, it was through the sacrament of conf uh, Later on, through the sacrament of confirmation, you and I once again received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Friend, we have had our John 20 experience. But for many Catholics today, they have not had the Acts chapter 2 Pentecost experience. This is the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon their life, where the anointing is made alive. Jesus says, Luke chapter 12, verse 49, I have come to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it was blazing already. The purpose of the Pentecost is to set your life and my life on fire. You have already received the oil. The oil dwells inside of us. But unfortunately, the oil has not been set on fire. Why did they receive the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? They received it so that they can become his witnesses. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible tells us, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Do not miss when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Friend, the biggest tragedy with many Catholics is that they have not experienced this personal Pentecost in their life. When the sacrament of confirmation should be to be able to send you and I into mission. Catechism of the Catholic Church 1302 tells us that during the sacrament of confirmation, you and I should have encountered a personal Pentecost. It says, 1302 Catechism of the Catholic Church says, It is evident from its celebration that the effect of the sacrament of confirmation is the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit as once granted to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. On the day of the sacrament of confirmation, you and I needed to have experienced this powerful anointing that would have transformed us to become witnesses. The anointing of the Holy Spirit that would have transformed our lives in the early church, friends. The anointing transformed them from mere cowards, mere fishermen, to stand up and proclaim the wonders of God. On the day of Pentecost, their lives were transformed, friends. They were set on fire. Catechism of the Catholic Church 1285 says, By the sacrament of confirmation, the baptized are more perfectly bound to the church and are enriched, mark the words, enriched with special strength of the Holy Spirit. You and I have the special strength of the Holy Spirit. What is the catechism talking about? This is the anointing that is in your life and my life. But why has God given us this anointing? Why is the, there the anointing in our life? Yes, the anointing is there to break the yoke, but much more than that, the anointing is there so that you and I can spread and defend the faith by word and by deed. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can spread and defend the faith. But we cannot spread and defend the faith if we are under the yoke of slavery, if we are under bondage to slavery. So the anointing comes to break that yoke. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Friend, this is the very purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand, friends. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not another baptism. You have already been baptized from the day of your baptism, and that's the one and only baptism that you and I need. But the term baptism in the Holy Spirit comes from the term baptism comes from the, the root word baptizo means to be immersed. That means that you and I are to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, to be set on fire by the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit would take control of our lives. 
that the anointing would start flowing through us. The 16, Pope Benedict the 16th said this in April 2008. He said, let us implore from God the grace for a new Pentecost for the church in America. May tongues of fire combining with burning love of God and neighbor with zeal for the spread of his kingdom descend on all present. Pope Benedict the 16th prayed for the grace of a new Pentecost for the church in America, but also for you and I that we may experience this new Pentecost. Pope Benedict XVI speaking on the solemnity of the baptism of the Lord on January 2008, he said this, Christ's entire mission can be summed up in this. Jesus came to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, to free us from the slavery of death. You see, friends, the anointing breaks the yoke. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, breaks the yoke of slavery to death. It opens up heaven to us. That is to access the true and full life that is the plunging ever anew into the vastness of being to which we are simply overwhelmed. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit's purpose, twofold. Number one, to break the slavery, to free us from the slavery of death. And number two, to open up heaven to us for, mi for missions, for ministry, for the proclamation of the kingdom of God, so that heaven comes down to earth and people begin to experience heaven through you and I. In 1972, Pope Paul VI said this, for more than once we have asked ourselves what are the greatest needs of the church and we say the primary and ultimate need of our beloved and holy catholic church we must say it with holy fear because as you know this concerns the mystery of the church this need is the spirit he says the church needs her eternal pentecost pope paul the 6th 1972 the church needs her eternal pentecost what does she need she needs fire in her heart she needs the word of god in her lips she needs a glance that is prophetic a prophetic vision so the church needs an eternal Pentecost. It was for this same reason that Pope John the 23rd on convening the Second Vatican Council composed a prayer to the Holy Spirit in 1961. In the document Humani Saluti, 1961, Pope John the 23rd prayed to the Holy Spirit, Divine Spirit, renew your wonders in our time as though a new Pentecost and granted the whole church preserving unanimous and continuous prayer together with Mary, the mother of Jesus, under the guidance of St. Peter, may increase the reign of the divine Savior. He prayed for a new Pentecost. Renew your wonders in our time as though a new Pentecost for one purpose, friends, so that the reign of the divine Savior may increase. Pope Francis used a very powerful terminology, terminology of electricity even. He said that, that the Catholic charismatic renewal has the ability to share the current of grace to the whole church. Speaking in Rome, Italy in June 2014 for Renewamento Nello Spirito Santo, the renewal of the Holy Spirit in Italy. He said, you charismatic renewal have received a great gift from the Lord. Your movement's birth was willed by the Holy Spirit to be a current of grace in the church and for the church. This is your identity, to be a current of grace. Speaking at uh, the third worldwide priest retreat in 2015, Pope Francis said, I ask all of you, about 5,000 priests were gathered, and he said to all of them, I ask all of you, each of you, to become at that part, as part of the stream of grace of the charismatic renewal. You plan life in the Spirit seminar. Share the baptism of the Holy Spirit and your catechesis because it is produced by the work of the Holy Spirit through a personal encounter with Jesus, which changes lives. Then once again in June 2017, speaking at Circus Maximus for the 50th Jubilee of Catholic Charismatic Renewal, Pope Francis said, share with the all in the church the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Share with everyone the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is what the church and the Pope expects of you, Catholic Charismatic Renewal. But from all of you who have entered this current of grace, 
Pope Francis speaks of the charismatic renewal as this current of grace. This current, this maybe if you look at it in a different um, in a different word, maybe you can consider it this anointing, this anointing, this current of grace that flows through you and I by virtue of our baptism. When did you and I receive this current of grace? We received it on the day of our baptism. Pope Benedict the 16th, May 2008, he said, this was the baptism of the Holy Spirit foretold by John the Baptist. And then he quotes Matthew 3, 11, where Jesus said, where John the Baptist says, he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. And then, quoting from Jesus himself, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, where Jesus tells his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then Pope Benedict XVI makes a very daring statement. I would like to extend the invitation to all to rediscover, dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let us recover the awareness of our baptism and our confirmation ever timely sources of grace. So friends, you and I need to understand it this way. We already have the Holy Spirit. By virtue of the sacrament of baptism and confirmation, we already have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you and I. But despite the presence of the Holy Spirit, we are still struggling with sin, with bondage, with depression, with anxiety, with problems left, right and center. Now, I propose to you the reason is because we have received the Holy Spirit just like the disciples did in John 20, but there is not yet the Pentecost incident in our life. Acts 2 has not happened. So we are still struggling with fear and anxiety as the disciples were struggling in John chapter 20, struggling with here fear and anxiety hiding in the upper room. They have already received the Holy Spirit, but the Pentecost has not exp uh, the Pentecost experience has not yet happened. So, friends, this means that we need to open ourselves up in a new way. You need to open yourself up in a new way. I need to open up myself up in a new way to the Holy Spirit. That is why Benedict the Sixteenth says, "Let us rediscover." the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let us recover awareness of our baptism and confirmation. Two words, rediscover and recover. Take back what is yours. It is rightfully yours. Let us ask for the Virgin Mary to obtain for a renewed Pentecost for the whole church that will be imbued in all, especially in the young, the joy and the witnessing of the gospel. You see, friends, the sacraments, most especially the sacrament of baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, reconciliation, uh, efficacious signs of grace. Catechism of the Catholic Church 1131. That means through the sacraments, the grace of God is ever present. You and I can encounter the grace of God through the sacraments. What is a grace? A grace is the free, undeserved gift of God's love in our life. It's a free, undeserved gift of God's presence in our life. That's grace. Unmerited favor that dwells inside of you. That's why John Newton composed that song, Amazing Grace. Grace is the presence of God, the anointing of God, the presence, the power of God dwelling in our life. God offers us grace out of his unconditional love. You cannot buy grace. You cannot earn grace. It is freely given. Grace empowers us to know God as who he really is, to love him and to serve him. Grace enables us to grow in faith and strengthens our faith. Grace en enhances our freedom rather than restricts our freedom. Grace helps us to choose to work towards overcoming original sin and the power of evil in our life. This anointing, this grace that dwells in us has the power to break the power of evil in our life. Catechism of the Catholic Church 1996 to 2005 tells us that there are four forms of grace. Number one, sanctifying grace, the grace to make you holy. God has given that grace in your life. Number two, actual graces. 
the grace of a in a particular situation and circumstance that you're facing maybe it is through a personal struggle you're going through a personal crisis you're going through God brings grace in that moment number three sacramental grace through the Eucharist through a sacramental of reconciliation to those of us who are married through the sacrament of matrimony there is grace through the sacrament and finally charisms special graces for one's state of life God gives you charisms for the purpose of the building of the body of Christ and these graces are given with one purpose friends so that the presence of God can begin to flow through us so that your life and my life will be strengthened by the power of God unfortunately we have blocked that graces from flowing by virtue of sin and stubbornness pride and anger unforgiveness we have blocked these graces in our life and the moment we repent the moment we give our lives back into the hands of God, the moment we ask the Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come and take control of my life, these graces start flowing once again. The anointing will break that yoke over your life. It is the fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. So why do you and I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Number one, the anointing of the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual breakthroughs 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 to 5 Paul says I did not come to you with lofty words of man's wisdom rather I came in weakness in fear and much trembling my speech and proclamation were not with plausible words of man's wisdom but with a demonstration of spirit and power why friends Paul was a theologian Paul was a learned Hebrew a Pharisee and yet he says he did not come with plausible words of man's wisdom he came with a demonstration of spirit and power why because the anointing of the Holy Spirit is able to touch your mouth and through that the power of the Spirit is able to be communicated this is the same thing that happened to that fisherman Peter on the day of Pentecost when he stood up and preached his first sermon 3,000 people were cut to their heart and they said what must we do to be saved friends the power of the anointing that comes through the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives number two the anointing of the Holy Spirit releases boldness in ministry Acts chapter 4 verse 29 to 31 when the, the disciples were faced with persecution and they were hiding they began to pray Lord look at their threats and grant your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hands to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus and the Bible says when they prayed the place in which they were gathered together was shaken they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God with boldness the anointing of the Holy Spirit brings about boldness in ministry not fear not timidity the anointing brings about boldness number three the anointing gives you the capability to take back your inheritance what you have lost the happiness you have lost the joy you have lost the peace you have lost to the enemy that he has managed to rob you of your life Deuteronomy 121 go up take possession as the Lord your God has promised you do not be afraid or do not be dismayed God will give you back what was lost Joel chapter 2 verse 24 to 25 I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten God will give back everything that was lost number four God gives the anointing so that you and I are able to gather the harvest Acts chapter 1 verse 8 so that you shall be my witness in Jerusalem Judea Samaria right up to the ends of the earth in your own power my my power friends it is not able you and I are not able to respond to the call of God to become laborers in the harvest but the power of the Holy Spirit the anointing of the Holy Spirit enables us to do this number five so that we can do greater works than Jesus did Jesus himself promised John chapter 14 verse 12 very truly I tell you the one who believes in me 
will do the works that I do. In fact, will do greater works than this because I am going to the Father. This is the promise of Jesus, that you and I will be able to do greater works than Jesus did. John chapter 14 verse 2. Why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells inside you and I. Because the presence of God dwells within you and I. Because the anointing of God dwells within you and I. So you and I have received this power of the Holy Spirit through the, by virtue of the sacrament of baptism. But we need to activate. We need to activate this sacrament. We need to activate the power of, of the, the grace of this sacrament in our lives. In, in Latin, there are two words that speak about how the sacraments work. Ex opera operato, ex opera operato, that means that within the sacrament itself has the power of the sacrament to work by itself. That means God is always present and always at work in and through the, the sacraments. Ex opera operato. But there is another word that is equally as important. Ex opera operantis. Ex opera operantis. That means for the, in order for that sacrament to work, you and I need to cooperate with that sacrament from the power of the person taking part in that sacrament. The graces offered in the sacraments need to be freely accepted and lived. If witness of the sacrament is directly the effectiveness of the sacrament is directly linked to our readiness and attitude as we receive them. So the sacraments are not magic, friends, some abracadabra, in spite and despite of you. No. For the, in order for the sacrament to work, there needs to be a response from my part. God's grace always comes with the responsibility to live as Jesus' disciples. So, friend, let's say because of some obstacle in my life and your life, does that mean the sacrament is not valid? No, the sacrament is absolutely valid. What is the problem then? The problem is with me. The grace is blocked from flowing into my life. The grace that the sacrament is able to give me, either Eucharist or reconciliation, there is a block in my life and it's not able to bring about the, the, the benefits that the sacrament is supposed to give into my life. And therefore, we find that we are struggling. We are fighting an endless battle. We find it seems as if we have lost the presence of God. Now the consequences of the lack of that openness to the sacraments, consequences of the lack of the openness to the anointing. There's a lack of spiritual stamina. People find ministry a drudgery and a burden. It's so difficult to get people to respond to ministry. There's no real lasting transformation in the lives of people. They come for a Life in the Spirit seminar, they experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One week passes, two weeks passes, they're back to square one again. No real lasting transformation. Lack of motivation. No direction in their life and in their mission. They're just going around haphazardly, being jack of all trades in the parish, trying to do stopgap ministry, filling up everything, jack of, jack of all trades. No direction, personal or communal. Losing the passion for ministry. Ending up in a blame game. Church politics. Have you found that? Anger, hatred, unforgiveness. Doing ministry, but harboring anger, hatred, unforgiveness in your heart. Competition in ministry. Trying to up somebody else. Looking for position, power, as if in the world. Looking for financial gain, using ministry for financial gain. Inability to hear the voice of God. Having burnt out, burnout in ministry. Running around doing so many things, but in the end, there are no fruits in the tree. No drive and passion for the lost. Constantly needing breaks and holidays in ministry. 
no spiritual growth, remaining in comfort zones, not able to step out and try new things, no longer in the cutting edge of ministry. Friend, what do you and I need? We need fresh oil. We need a fresh anointing. A fresh anointing that will break that yoke in our life. The consequence of the fresh oil, Psalm 92 verse 10 to 15 says, you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox and have poured over me fresh oil. Very interesting, yes? Very interesting that the psalmist uses the term exalted my horn like that of a wild ox and poured over me fresh oil. Friend, how do you get a horn? You get a horn from an animal. But in order to contribute the horn, the animal first has to die. When the animal is dead, then the horn is taken, then the horn can be filled with oil and poured over for anointing. Friend, many of us want a fresh anointing, but we don't want the sacrifice. There is no horn. We want some kind of stopgap measure, blessing, but no sacrifice. But the psalmist says, once we receive the fresh oil, you have poured over me fresh oil, things will start changing in your life and my life. Your eyes will be open. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. Your ears will be open. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailant. The righteous will flourish like the palm tree. You will begin to flourish. Number four, you will begin to grow like the cedar of Lebanon. Number five, you will be planted in the house of the Lord and they shall flourish in the courts of God. Number six, in all age they shall produce fruit. They are, shall be always green, full of sap, showing, revealing that the Lord is upright and that he, he is my rock and there is no unrighteous in him. The psalmist gives us seven keys, seven keys that happens as a consequence of fresh oil. Number one, your eyes will be open. Number two, your ears will begin to hear. Number three, you will flourish. Number four, you will grow. Number five, you'll be planted. Number six, you'll produce fruit. Number seven, you will always remain green. And in all, when all this comes together in your life, your life will be a revelation, will show the glory of God to the world. Friend, this is the consequence of fresh oil. We heard just now what the lack of the oil can do. We heard what fresh oil can do. Pope Francis, how do we get this fresh oil? How do you get this fresh oil? Well, you've got to go back to nature. How do you get fresh oil? Do you have any idea how do you get oil in the first place? How is oil produced? How is olive oil produced? Olive oil comes from crushing of the olive. The crushing of the olive produces olive oil. Let me show you very quickly. Firstly, you get some raw olives, raw fresh olives. You put the olives in a blender and blend them until they are in a paste form. Once you get them in the paste form, then you put them into a pot and you start heating the pot on a fire for about five to 10 minutes. The oil, the, the olive paste under fire becomes soft. You put Put the entire olive paste in a draining container. Once you've put it into the draining container, then you start squeezing. Once you've put the olive in a draining container, tighten it up and then start to squeeze it. As you squeeze it, the oil will begin to drip out of the olive. Little by little, olive oil starts coming out. First in its impure form, 
let it sit overnight and as it sits overnight this olive oil will separate and the top layer you can take off the olive oil friend this gives you a very important spiritual principle in order to get that oil out of that olive the olive has to go through crushing through the blending after the blending it needs to be put on a fire after the fire it's put into a, a container and then squeezed number one crushing number two fire number three squeezed and then finally once the oil has dripped and it's come out still in its impure form you need to let it sit overnight wait wait Jesus said to the disciples wait here in Jerusalem for what my father has promised not many days from now you will receive the Holy Spirit wait so here we go again number one the crushing number two the fire number three the squeezing number four the sitting the waiting and finally comes out this olive oil friend the anointing comes with a price the anointing comes with a price are you ready to be crushed to be blended are you ready to be put through the furnace of fire to be set on fire are you ready to be squeezed are you ready to wait when these elements are at work in your life then know this for sure the oil will be produced in your life the olive oil will be produced in your life in the second book of Kings chapter 4 verse 1 to 7 there is a story of the jar of untapped oil there's a story of the jar of untapped oil and in this story there are 10 keys 10 keys that I want to bring for you about how to allow this oil to start flowing through your life and my life again how to allow the anointing to start flowing through your life and my life again 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 1 to 7 in verse 1 it says now the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha your servant my husband is dead to give you some background Elisha had a company of prophets a school of prophets who traveled with him wherever he went the prophets died and after his death his wife came to Elisha asking for help she said your servant my husband is dead you know that your servant feared the Lord but now creditors have come to take my two children as slaves this widow was about to lose her two children to the creditors because she had no money to pay the creditors maybe friends you are in such a situation yourself right now through COVID-19 through this pandemic you might have lost your job you might have lost your source of income you're going through fear anxiety maybe just like this widow a member of your family has died the breadwinner of your family has died and now you have to face the creditors friend do not lose heart do not be afraid do not be afraid just like this widow this area this situation this need in your life is a preparation for the oil to start flowing once again God has allowed this to happen so don't be discouraged don't be afraid God has allowed this so that through this God will work it out for good in your life Romans chapter 8 verse 28 
all things work for good for those who love God. Even through this, something good is going to come out. This situation is preparing you and I for the miracle. So she came to Elijah and she was complaining, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But now the creditors have come to take my children. Elisha says to her, what shall I do for you? What can I do for you? Tell me. And then he asks her a very pertinent question, very important question. What do you have in your house? You see, friends, God doesn't work out of nothing. He works with what you already have. So Elisha asks the widow, tell me what you have in your house. Well, basically, she's lost everything. So basically, she has nothing. So she replies, your servant has nothing in the house except the jar of oil. You see, friends, for the widow, this jar of oil is insignificant. It's useless. It's not going to benefit her in any way. This jar of oil is just sitting in the house, but she considers that she has nothing. Maybe you and I are in the same boat as well. God is asking, what do you have? Show me what is in your hand. And our response is, but Lord, I have nothing. I have nothing. Friend, if that is your mindset, you will not be able to see beyond your nothing. No, friend, you do not have nothing. You have something that is more, that is of more value than anything else in the world. And what is this something? You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. So she says, your servant has nothing except the jar of oil. Number two, principle number two, the oil is the beginning of the miracle. In your life, the Holy Spirit in you is the beginning of your miracle. A light that is very important. What do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing except the jar of oil. What is in your house, friends? The jar of oil is in your house. Not only do you have the jar of oil, it's in your house. Not only do you have the Holy Spirit, He's in your house. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's in your house. He's in your life. He's, he's not somewhere outside waiting for you to call on Him. He's in your house. Verse 3. Elisha gives her very specific instructions. He says, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not just a few. Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and just not a few. The fourth important principle, when God's word touches the oil, increase is coming. So it's very important you know the Word of God. You know the Word of God. You need to know what the Word of God says for that oil to be transformed. She heard very clearly his instructions. Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not just a few. So it's very important you and I be able to hear the voice of God. John chapter 10 verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, I know them. And they follow me. The fifth principle, very important. You need to humble yourself. Now you've heard the voice of God, you need to humble yourself. God has given you specific instructions. In the case of this widow, Elisha gave her specific instructions. Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors. Wow, that must have been really hard. Because in order to go outside and borrow vessels from all her neighbors, she needed to humble herself. She needed to go and beg. She needed to go and ask. Not just, it didn't say just go and get from one neighbor one vessel. Go and ask from house to house and collect as many vessels as possible from all your neighbors. And in order for that to happen, you need to go outside. You need to go outside. You need to take the effort. You need to humble yourself in the eyes of God and the eyes of people around you. People might be looking down on you and saying to you, 
but I thought he was capable of taking care of himself. Look at what has happened in his life. People might be judging you, but you need to come to a place where it does not matter what people think about you. What is important is that you want to be obedient to the voice of God. So this woman went outside and borrowed empty vessels. Empty vessels and not just a few. So you cannot just come back with one or two vessels and say, Lord, I'm done. No, go from house to house. And each door that you go to, a little bit more of you will die. A little bit more of you will die. But that crushing, that blending, that squeezing is good because it's preparation for the oil to come. Then he says, once you've collected all the vessels, go in, shut the door behind you and your children. Once you've collected all the vessels, go in. First he says, go outside. Then he says, go in, shut the door behind you and your children. Where else have you heard this word, shut the door behind you? When Jesus said, when you're praying, go into your room, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in secret. And the father who sees everything you do in secret will hear you. Friend, the miracle does not happen in the public eye. The miracle happens in the secret place. Shut the door behind you. Learn to go into the secret place because that's where the miracle begins. That's where your miracle begins. That's where the oil comes. Friends, not in the public eye. There are a lot of people who, for want of appreciation and acknowledgement from the world, want to perform miracles so that the whole world will see. But Elisha is giving this widow the key to where the miracle happens. The miracle does not happen in the public eye. It happens behind shut doors. If you and I can discover the secret, friends, then you and I will be running behind the shut door. It's very interesting that I'm saying this right now to you because I myself right now am shut in. Shut in for 14 days here in quarantine in a hotel in Kuala Lumpur. For the last 14 days, no fresh air, no sunshine. I've not seen the sun for 14 days. And in the midst of all this, inside the shut door, inside this secret place, God is working. The oil is flowing. Go in, shut the door behind you, start pouring into the vessels. Start pouring into the vessels. When each is full, set it aside. This woman can typically think, come on, come on. There is only so much of oil. You've asked me to collect all these vessels, and if I start pouring, how is there going to be enough oil to pour into all the vessels? But you know, God is looking for obedience, not logic, obedience. Just start pouring, just start pouring. As you pour, more oil will come out. What does that mean, friends? As you are pouring into empty vessels, it will continue to fill up by itself. And it will continue to flow and flow. It will flow and flow. And as one is full, you start pouring on the next one. It will continue to flow and flow. Friend, this gives us an indication. After you and I have gone into the secret place, the next very important thing we got to do, we start, we've got to start pouring out the anointing onto others. Start being a blessing onto others. There are many ways you can do this. You can start by interceding for somebody else. You can start by praying for somebody else. You can start exercising your charismatic gifts for somebody else. But don't just keep it for yourself. Start pouring it out. The more you pour, the more will come. The more you give, the more you will receive. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, flowing over on your lap, it will come into your life. But you need to give before you receive. The oil will fill every empty vessel in the house as long as you keep pouring. 
So the key is this, don't stop pouring, keep pouring. When one is full, set it aside, keep pouring. Verse 5, so she left him, shut the door behind her and the children. They kept bringing vessels and she kept pouring. Principle number 8, the oil will fill to capacity whatever vessel you bring. They started bringing, the children started bringing vessels to her and she started pouring. One liter vessel, one liter worth of oil. Two liter vessel, two liter worth of oil. 0.5 liter vessel, 0.5 liter worth of oil. The oil will fill up every vessel. The key is this, you need to have enough vessels. In the midst of the pouring, she, once she saw the miracle, she cannot say to her sons, her children, Go and get more vessels. No, friend, no. If she brought only five vessels, she would have only five vessels worth of oil filled. If she brought 50 vessels, she would have 50 vessels worth of oil filled. Friend, this speaks of expectant faith. You and I need to have expectant faith so that you believe that God can fulfill, accomplish what he began in your life. He's not going to leave you in the end. Verse 6, when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, mom, there are no more vessels. Then the oil stopped flowing. The oil will flow as long as there are vessels. Once there are no more vessels, the oil will stop flowing. The oil of anointing in your life your mission in your life will stop flowing once your assignment is completed. Once the mission you're supposed to do is completed, then the anointing will stop flowing. The anointing's purpose was to meet that particular need. And it kept on flowing. But once there is no more that need, then there is no necessity for this anymore. Verse 7, she came to the man of God and she said, go. Verse 7, she came to the man of God and the man of God said to her. Verse 7, she came to the man of God and the man of God said to her, go sell the oil, pay your debts, you and your children can live on the rest. Go sell the oil, pay your debts, you and your children can live on the rest. The provision of God change the status of our life. The oil supply changed the status of our life. Number one, she had enough oil now to go and sell and to pay all her debts. That means, friend, the anointing in your life will supply all that you need. God would supply all that you need through the oil that is already in your life. And not only will he give you enough to fill all the vessels to sell so that you can pay your debts but he will give you more than enough so that you can live off the rest hallelujah this is great news friends friend if you're listening to this right now and you are in the position of this widow i want to invite you ask god to increase the flow of this oil the oil will change your status and you can live on the rest. So very quickly, the 10 principles again from 2 Kings chapter 4, the jar of the untapped oil. Number one, the need, your need, your circumstances right now prepares you for the miracle. Number two, the oil is the beginning of the miracle. Number three, the oil is already in your house, already inside of you. Number four, the oil will multiply when God's word touches it. So it's important to hear the word of God. Number five, you need to humble yourself to go out and borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not a few. So humility is an important key for the, the abundance to begin to flow. Number six, the miracle happens in secret place behind the shut door. Number seven, the oil will fill every empty vessel. When you start pouring, there will be more than enough. It will keep on flowing. Number eight, the oil will fill to capacity whatever vessel you bring. What is the capacity of your vessel? Number nine, the oil will stop flowing once your assignment is completed. Number 10, the oil will change the status of your life and you will live 
on the rest. So friends, what do you do now? Let me propose to you three steps, friends, what do you need to do. Number one, for the anointing to start flowing through your life, you need to open your mouth and personally invite the Holy Spirit. You need to open your mouth and personally invite the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said, which of you would give a snake to those who ask, your children who ask for a fish, or a stone, or a scorpion, to those who ask for some food. How much more the Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. So you need to ask for the Holy Spirit. Pope John Paul II, October 21, 1992, he said, be open to Christ, welcome the Holy Spirit so that a new Pentecost may take place in every community. Welcome the Holy Spirit. So key number one, you need to open your mouth and welcome the Holy Spirit. Number two, you need to be open to the anointing, docility to the charisms. Remember the graces that flow through your life. In May 30th, 1998, John Paul II, again speaking to ecclesial lay movements of the world, he said, open yourself docilely to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Accept gracefully and obediently the charisms the Spirit never ceases to bestow on us. Do not forget that every charism is given for the common good, for the benefit of the whole church. And number three, the final point, ask the Holy Spirit to set your oil on fire. Ask the Holy Spirit to set your oil on fire. In the document to the church in Asia, Ecclesia in Asia number 23, John Paul II said, the good news of Jesus Christ can only be proclaimed by those who have been taken up and inspired by the love of the Father manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. This proclamation is a mission needing holy men and women who will make the Savior known and loved through their lives. Then he says something amazing. John Paul II says, a fire can only be lit by something that is itself on fire. You can only be lit if you allow yourself to catch the fire from someone else. And once you are on fire, the people who come in contact with you will also catch the fire. A fire can only be lit by something that is itself on fire. So too successful proclamation in Asia of the good news of salvation can only take place if bishops, clergy, consecrated laity, are themselves on fire with the love of Christ and burning with zeal to make him known more widely, loved more deeply, and followed more closely. So friends, I want to pray for you right now. Pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to come upon your life so that the Holy Spirit will transform your life. Friend, would you allow the Holy Spirit to touch you? Would you welcome the Holy Spirit together with me? As we go into this time of prayer, as we worship the Lord, we're going to call on the Holy Spirit to come and to set our lives on fire. Friends, I invite you, if you know this song, join me again as we worship the Lord. All it takes is one moment And just one touch from you I put aside all distractions Cause I came for you I came for you I need you more than ever Nothing else satisfies All my life I surrender I live for you, I live for you, I came for you, I came for you, Holy Spirit, you are welcome, 
Come and move upon this place We desire an encounter once again Holy Spirit My heart is open I am ready for you Jesus take me deeper I came for you I came for you I came for you I came for you Spirit, you are welcome. Come and move upon this place. We desire an encounter once again. Send your fire, release your power. So we'll never be the same We desire an encounter once again We make way, we make room Lord, let your spirit your way in this place Lord we have come for you we make way we make room Lord let your spirit move have your way in this place Spirit, you are welcome. Come and move upon this place. We desire an encounter once again. Send your fire, release your power. So we'll never be the same We desire an encounter once again Holy Spirit Holy Spirit Lord, let your spirit move. Come, Lord Jesus. Come right now. 
Corra baran la cara barra la 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 He dwells inside of you. Put your arms over your chest. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I invite you to say a prayer of surrender to the Holy Spirit so that this fresh oil can begin to flow in your life. I invite the Holy Spirit to come. Say, say with me. Come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, take control of my life. Say that out loud. Come, Holy Spirit, take control of my mind. Come, Holy Spirit, take control of my needs. I want to know you more. I want to surrender my life into your hands. Come Holy Spirit, touch my mind. Come Holy Spirit, touch my heart. Come Holy Spirit, touch my fear. Touch my emptiness. Touch my loneliness. Touch my anxiety. I surrender my future into your hands. I surrender my family into your hands. Come Holy Spirit. Move in my life, Holy Spirit of God. Say out loud, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Corra barranda la caria barranda la caria barranda la caria barranda la 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 caria barranda la la. Spirit of God flowing through you right now. Spirit of God touching you right now. Jesus is saying He provides for your financial situation. Do not be afraid. You're struggling in your marriage. Jesus is saying his hand is over your marriage right now. Surrender your spouse into my hands, Jesus says. I'm flowing through you right now to reach your spouse. Receive my peace right now. You're struggling with anxiety and stress. The love of Jesus is flowing through you through the power of the Holy Spirit right now. Receive right now. Fear is being broken. Receive right now. Receive the power of the love of Jesus flowing through your life. Somebody's praying for a child. Jesus is blessing your womb right now with the gift of this child. Somebody is praying for a cancer. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Your life is in my hands. Someone is afraid for the future of their son, their daughter, to provide for their son or their daughter. God says, did I not provide for that widow? Trust me. I will cause the oil to flow in your life 
and there will be more than enough. Receive right now the grace of God flowing through you, friend. Don't be afraid. The presence of the Spirit filling you right now. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Say with me, come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Just begin to say thank you Jesus, praise you Jesus as I pray for you. We thank you and we praise you, Jesus. We thank you and we praise you. We give you all glory and honor, blessing and power. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for touching us. Thank you for rekindling the gift of the Holy Spirit in our life. We give you all praise and glory and honor. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed Mother, we ask for your intercession. Together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, friends. Friends, thank you for joining me for this last seven episodes on this Victory Series. I pray that God has truly blessed you. It's been a privilege for me to take this time to be with you. May you experience the abundant blessing of God as you prepare for this great feast of Pentecost in your life. We thank you. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Hi there, Jude Antoine here. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that it has blessed you. If you're interested in more videos, please subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking on the bell right over here. If you are interested to watch more videos, please watch any in the playlist right over here. Thank you. May God bless you.